Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today, the car, the 2017 Ford GT. I've had this about a week, and I've put just about 1,000 miles on it, and uh, it's pretty amazing. And we'll get into the whole car in just a second. Uh, I want to show you what I have to go through to get one of these. You know, all the money I saved on clothes, I was able to buy this car. And uh, it was a substantial savings, believe me. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard the process. You have to fill out a whole deal, and, and, and uh, which I think was good, because what happens when cars like this come out? Uh, speculators come in, and they buy the car, and then they flip it. And if I was a manufacturer and I put my heart and the soul into an automobile, I wouldn't want to see some speculator buy it and then flip it. So well, you fill out this whole program. How do you intend to use the car? What other collector cars do you have? How many miles do you drive? You know. And I did all that and was able to uh, secure one of these because I have a 2005 Ford GT, which has the same number uh, serial number as this one, number 12. Um, so that worked out pretty good. Now, after you do that whole deal where you, where you fill out the form, they then send you this box. Now, this box is, uh, is kind of cool. See, I love all this kind of stuff, okay. First you got a box, in a box, okay. Okay, now here's what it is. What do they call this, this configure deal? You see, and it's got all this stuff in it here, you get all this out of here, here we go. And then inside the box is this thing. And then you take this off, open that up, and you go, what could this be? This helps you configure your car. Okay, so you open this deal here. Okay, and then this slides apart, and then this comes out. I know, this is a whole, it's a whole big deal. Okay, but this helps you choose the colors and what you want on your car. These are interior colors, and these are, uh, oh, well, this is interior colors here. I've got the orange, as you can see, black with orange stripes. Uh, and these are the different wheels. These are the titanium wheels. Um, there's not a whole lot of options with this car. I got just about every option, titanium wheels, the stripes. I didn't get the, uh, the exhaust system, the titanium exhaust system, because it doesn't really sound any different. You don't really see it, and it's only... 10 pounds different weight, plus it's $10,000 more. And you know, for 10 grand, I can lose 10 pounds. But that's basically what you got. But it's kind of fun. You've got all the different colors that are available on the car. Uh, I chose the black with orange just because I like black with orange. Uh, silver, well, anyway, this is the whole configure deal here. Now, the other cool thing they do is they send you pictures of your car being built. Now, although Henry Ford did, uh, he didn't invent the assembly line, but he certainly made the assembly line popular. This car couldn't be further from the assembly line because each one is sort of individually built. Well, here, here, here's some of the pictures of it here. As you can see, the car is assembled in what appears to be a, hos a hospital for automobiles. Everything is clean, it's done in a clean room. It's really fantastic. Then they send you this whole thing about the options that your car had. Uh, here it is here. Make, owner, blah, 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 blah. And you know, passion emissions and all that kind of stuff. But that's just a few of the, the things you get. And of course, it takes a little while to get one of these because uh, they're all hand assembled. I don't think you make a great deal of money on these cars. I think this is what you call a halo car in the sense that it brings a tremendous amount of prestige to a company like Ford Motor Company. Uh, my favorite thing about this car is it's still a Ford. You know, a lot of times manufacturers, when they make uh, sort of everyday automobiles, pickup trucks and minivans and all that kind of stuff, and they go upscale, they change the name. Honda becomes Acura. Toyota becomes Lexus. I love the fact that Ford, even though this is just about a half a million dollar car, they didn't change it to the Ford, you know, some fancy name. <clears throat> they kept it a Ford. And I like that. I think, that's, uh, I think that's, that's pretty cool. And this car is about as far from the first generation uh, Ford GT as you could get. Because the first Ford GT was a road car built to resemble a race car. This one 
is an out-and-out -out race car built to be, well, or modified to be, I guess, a road car. This reminds me a lot of my McLaren F1 because the McLaren F1 was a road car. They literally, you could have driven to Le Mans, Le Mans, won the race and driven back. And this is pretty much the same thing. This has all the features of the race car with actually more horsepower because the car had to be detuned for Le Mans. Now, a big sticking point with this car with a lot of people who have never driven it and know nothing about it is the fact that it has a V6. Again, I applaud Ford for that, for trying something different. Um, everyone thinks, oh, it needs a V8 or a V12. But you know, this car is really all about the chassis. It's really all about aerodynamics. It's all about handling. I think it's got just about the best chassis. And you know, I'm not a race car driver. I don't know. But of any car I've ever driven. I mean, it is amazing on the track. This is why the car won Le Mans. You know, there are plenty of high-end Italian and German exotics that are out there, and some of them cost two or three times the price of this thing, but they haven't won Le Mans. And if you think winning Le Mans is easy, <laughs> it's not. Uh, so that's what makes it kind of cool. In fact, my license plate says back to Le Mans. Uh, I, I put that on there. Oh, and how cool is this? Ford actually dropped off at my garage the 2016 uh, Le Mans winning Ford GT. This is the actual car that won the race. It's still got the original dirt and everything on it. Nobody's washed it, nobody's touched it. And uh, it was a real honor to have it here. Uh, the aerodynamics of what this car is all about, and it makes it strikingly beautiful. I mean, I think it's as uh, good looking a supercar, and I think it's truly a supercar. I think it fits in with McLaren and Pagani and Ferrari. Uh, you know, some people might debate that because it's got a Ford on the on the nose, but I, I like that. I, I, I like the fact that they did it that way. Um, it's a pretty amazing automobile. It's got my favorite tires, Michelin's on it. Uh, this car handles really like no other. Uh, the V6 engine is the most powerful, I believe, V6 engine ever produced, at least up to this point, 647 horsepower. It's a V6 to make it more compact and is it based on the, uh, the F-150 truck engine? No, oh, I suppose it is, but who cares? Uh, I'm sure there are probably more sophisticated engines out there, although it's a four-valve twin cam, V6, twin turbo. Uh, that's, that's pretty exotic, although it's not the most exotic engine. But one thing it is is certainly the most exotic chassis and the most exotic use of... Uh, aerodynamics. You've got a number of modes. You've got wet, you've got sport, you've got track, and you've got VMAX. With VMAX, the whole, I think, the wing comes down and that helps you achieve the top speed of 216 miles an hour. Um, there's not many cars that can go 216 miles an hour. Uh, most of them are limited to probably just a little over 200. Uh, but just the fact that it can do it and do it with a V6 is pretty amazing. The car weighs a hair over 3,000 pounds, maybe 32 with all fluids and everything on it. So that makes it, uh, makes it pretty exotic. Um, I've been reading comments and road tests and people go, well, it's a little noisy. Well, it's a little, oh, shut up. It's a race car for the street. You know, it gives you a real sense of occasion. I mean, I've got an NSX and I like my NSX very much. And the NSX is billed as, uh, a supercar you could drive every day. You could drive this every day, but I don't drive it every day because this to me is a bit like uh, champagne. You know, a couple of times a month, once a week, you take it out, you have fun with it, and then you put it back because it feels like a race car, it drives like a race car, it handles like a race car. But that being said, I find the seats more comfortable than uh, my McLaren P1, which seemed a bit restrictive. Um, you sit very close together. I mean, you're, you're almost touching shoulders with your passenger because the idea is to get as much weight into the center of the car as possible. It's a perfectly balanced car. It's a wonderful handling car. And, uh, you know, a lot of people get upset because, well, I see some parts from the Ford parts bin in here. Well, to me, that works to its advantage because when you buy an exotic car, especially from a small uh, manufacturer, maybe European. I find the Bluetooth satellite navigation, that stuff never quite works as good as it does 
from a manufacturer that's made thousands, thousands, millions of these units. They, they've put in everything from SUVs to rental cars and the satellite nav, the Bluetooth, the radio, they all work perfectly. And that's what I like. It's a system I'm familiar with and it works right now. The really cool feature of this car, and I think makes it uh, really interesting, is the fact that um, the lift is hydraulic. You know, when you have uh, a lot of exotic supercars and you come to a driveway or uh, a raised area, you don't want to break that splitter. And you press that button, you hear that can you feel the compressor and you have to wait a minute and it kind of pumps it up you know my, in fact my my p1 does that you've you've got probably 30 seconds or so you got to hold press that button to lift front end this it literally bang it jumps up right away which is pretty cool because i've never scraped my i have a terrible driveway at home it goes like this and i ripped the splitter off of my 350r mustang whereas with this i hit the button bang it comes up and I've never scraped anything. It comes up two inches. Then you go to track mode on this thing, which is really cool. And much like uh, the McLaren P1, it literally, boom, it just falls down. It's like you've pulled the jacks out from under the car and the whole thing falls down. And I'll explain how that works to you in a little bit. Uh, the funniest thing about this car is the trunk. The trunk is hilarious. I wouldn't call it a glove box because you can only get one glove in there. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm gonna show you the trunk. Okay, this is your uh, complete trunk right here, and you've got your Ford battery charger. And you got all kinds of little bag here with all kinds of stuff. I love all the little stuff they give you. That's your battery charger. And this is uh, an, a tire inflator. I've never had a tire inflator that worked. You know, they give you that thing, and plug in a cigarette, like pss, pss. you got a big gaping hole in the sidewall, it's not going to work. But anyway, if you and your wife are going on a trip, you can maybe put one pair of panties in here, and, and that's about all you're going to have. And if you do go on a trip and your wife finds a pair of panties in here, make sure they're hers or you will lose half the car. Okay. Uh, this is how you check your oil. This is the funniest part of the car to me because you always check your oil when it's hot, all right? Okay, let me check the oil. <laughs> because that gets hot. That's really, really hot. But that's okay. That's, uh, I think all Ford GT owners will have the, the mark of shame. Much like the Heidelberg scar, which was popular during the First World War, this, the burned hand from checking your oil will show that you are a true enthusiast. As you can see, the titanium exhaust, you really can't see it anyway, so there's no reason to buy it. I like the fact you can even get to the engine on this car. A lot of supercars now, everything is sealed. You can't even touch it. So, In this car, the aerodynamics came first, and I think the design came second. But the aerodynamics dictated the design. And you know, nature is pretty attractive. And so you, you've got this ebb and flow here as all the, the wind goes through, as the air goes through this thing as you're driving, it's pretty amazing. And it's really like a vacuum cleaner. You know, you pick up rocks, you, you feel them rushing through the chassis as they, as they kind of get sucked up by the speed of this thing. It's, it's a lot of fun to drive. It's a real dramatic experience. And we'll, we'll take it out in just a minute. As you can see, it's a wide car from the back. Um, I really haven't tried to parallel park this thing. I love the way the... Uh, See, the, the uh, tail lights are also used to vent air. This is really a chassis car. You know, there are some cars that are an engine car. I think the, uh, like the Chrysler Hellcat, that's an, it's all about that big 707 horsepower engine. This is all about the chassis. This is what really, this is where the science went, this is where the engineering went. And the engine is really good. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's a 14-quart oil change on this thing. Well, 13.7, something like that. I just did the first oil change on it here, which I like. A lot of oil keeps it cool, a lot of stuff flowing around. I mean, I, I, I'm always leery when I get these cars that have five quart. It always seems like it's never enough. Um, haven't had any problems with it in the first 1,000 miles. Uh, everything works. Everything's fine. All the electronics work. Uh, you know, compared to a lot of other supercars out there, especially hybrids, 
it seem, um, seems amazingly uncomplicated, but it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's a complicated car. But yet, in that same way, it's, it's a simple car. It's, been, it's, it's built specifically to do one task, and that's to handle and drive quickly, and that's really what it does. And I think it's, it still looks like a Ford GT. It's like evolutionary styling. You know, when the 2005 one came out, I thought it was just unbelievable because it, it so mimicked the uh, 1966 car. Whereas this is a leaner, trimmer, better version of the 2005 car. I mean, it really does look like the next generation of the Ford GT. I can't imagine what the next generation is going to look like, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, I've got the carbon fiber wheels. I've told this story before. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Carbon Revolution, an Australian company, came here with some carbon fiber wheels. And uh, the wheels were $20,000 a piece. And they were hoping to sell them to high-end Porsche guys and uh, Lamborghini guys, Ferrari guys, stuff like that. And they told me, well, we're working with original, manu uh, original equipment manufacturer, and they wouldn't tell me who it was. Well, it turns out it was Ford. So they managed to get these wheels on the Ford GT, the 350R. And now they're available on this car as well. I've got the titanium lug nuts. They weigh just a couple of ounces a piece. The brakes are unbelievable. Um, the carbon brakes, it's a carbon fiber or carbon brakes. I can't remember which, but uh, they're unbelievable. I mean, incredible stopping power with this car. The car still has enough visceral feel. It's not like everything is done for you. I mean, a lot of it is done for you. It's got a seven-speed uh, dual-clutch transmission, which works uh, pretty f flawlessly. It's been very, very hot here this week in Los Angeles, well over uh, 100 degrees. And I've been out flogging it up in the hills and it never goes above normal. Uh, seems to work fine. It doesn't bing, bing, bing. You know, when you sometimes you shut off these supercars, they're so hot, you just feel all the metal and stuff contracting it. No, I don't get any of that with this. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. One kind of cool feature of the car, you can lock it using this little uh, window up here. See it lock and then you press on the red lock and it locks it. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the inside. As you can see, a little tricky to get into. You kind of put your butt in first and then sort of slide around. But actually quite comfortable. Uh, the seats are fixed. The seats do not move. You pull the strap here and the pedals come forward or backward. Everything is on the steering wheel, which is kind of the exact opposite of McLaren. Um, I prefer stocks outside, but here you got turn signal here, left and right. And you got, you know, you got cruise control. Why you have cruise control on this, I have no idea. Um, radio adjustments, all that kind of stuff. You've got your screen with your backup thing here. Uh, this is park, reverse, neutral drive. You put it in and you've got these. I think these look kind of cool the way they're cut out here, the, uh, the paddle shifters. Um, this is very basic um, air conditioning controls, which I like. I turn it on, I turn it off. You know, the one thing that drives me nuts about the NSX is the controls are so overly complicated. I don't like ones where I have to get on a screen and then push slide up and slide down because I'm taking my eye off the road. This thing, just reach over and you do this and that's fine. There's your start button right there. Let me show you how this uh, feature works. Let me start it up. Now, watch this. See, the car comes right up. It goes right down again. Not a quiet car by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, it probably gets a little loud when you're inside it, but that's what this car is built for. It's a race car. It's not meant to have a quiet mode on it. And it makes it great fun to drive, you know. Uh, I don't know why anybody would drive a car like this every single day. You don't want to sit in traffic with it. Although, I, again, I find it more comfortable. I mean, these seats are a bit wider, a bit more comfortable than the standard Recaro racing seat that I find in most cars. You know, I took them out of my Ford GT. I changed the seat in my uh, P1 McLaren just because it was, it was just too uncomfortable. The seat also moves back. You can adjust uh, the angle there. So there's plenty of room for me. I'm more than comfortable in this car. And you can see it's unfinished, unlacquered carbon fiber. Um, 
it's all pretty basic, which is what I like. I like the orange, it breaks it up a little bit. And you got courtesy lights and the usual stuff. Uh, you know what, I, I kind of laugh at myself when I read some of the road tests where people, it's not comfortable enough, it's not a GT car. It is a race car. It is the car that won Le Mans. I mean, people have no idea how hard that is to do. I mean, Ford had not been in Le Mans for 50 years. They had basically a year and a half to get this program together. They built a car and they beat the best the world had to offer. Ferrari, Porsche, Lamborghini, Audi. I mean, it was pretty amazing accomplishment. And uh, they did it on the 50th anniversary. They said they were going to do it, which put a lot of pressure on it. And I think that makes the car pretty special. Uh, in fact, it makes it real special. In fact, Let's take it for a ride, and uh, I'll show you what we're talking about. I'll start the car up, and uh, oh, before we take it for a ride, I'll put it in track mode for you. You can see what that's like. So it's literally drops, what, two inches? Dashboard changes, everything changes. Uh, dashboard. Do they still call it a dashboard? A display, I guess you'd call it. Uh, but pretty amazing. Uh, before you had amazing downforce, now you have unbelievable downforce. But track is a little too low for, uh, especially streets in LA. So let's, uh, let's bring it back up. There you go. Pops back up again. And we're uh, ready to go for a ride. Oh, it's a pretty comfortable car. In fact, it's quite comfortable. Uh, I, I, I read a few things online about people saying, oh, the seat should be more plush, or whatever. It's, it's a race car. If you'd bought a 427 Cobra in 1967, believe me, it'd be a lot rougher than this. But you've got anti-locks, you've got traction control, you've got all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, the, and as I said, the most incredible chassis I think ever put in a modern automobile. Uh, mirrors are good. Uh, rear view is actually quite good, uh, especially when the wing goes down. When you go from track mode back into normal sport mode, the wing won't come down unless you get above, I think, 35, 40 miles an hour. And you've got the controls on here. You can go from track to sport to wet to, you know, whatever. Can't really imagine driving this thing too much in the rain, but I suppose it happens. I remember when this car debuted at uh, the auto show. The NSX debuted at the same uh, auto show in Detroit, but nobody knew this was coming. Uh, there was no inkling, there was no leak photos. You know, one of the most annoying things to me is when uh, manufacturers leak a photo of a car they hadn't even built yet and act like it's, oh, it's going to be out in a matter of weeks, you know. Whereas this thing was developed in complete secrecy, the car was finished. And then they unveiled it at the auto show. What was it? Uh, 2015, I think, maybe. And oh my God, it just caused such a sensation. Because it really is a beautiful automobile, as well as being, you know, um, a successful race car. It's, it's, it's really an attractive shape. I haven't seen anything recently in Italy or Germany that's come out that's, uh, I think, looks as good as this. Once again, I love this feature. You press the button and the car goes low, press and it raises the front end up. Anytime I sense a bump or a railroad track, I hit that and bang, it comes up instantly and you never ever scrape. And in a thousand miles, I haven't scraped a splinter on this thing at all. I mean, I ripped it off my Mustang. You've got two modes, you can go straight manual and use the gearbox as you would a manual gearbox. By hand, it'll shift when you shift. Or you can put an automatic where it will shift, obviously, automatically. Or you can use manual and automatic as well at the same time. It takes a while to get used to the controls. I'm used to having a stock. You push the stock up or down. Here you've got buttons to go left or right. And, uh, you know, you got headlight flashers, windshield washers, everything on here.
You know, you can feel how aerodynamic the car is. You take it up to 60 or 70, and you take your foot off the gas, and it cuts through the air so cleanly. You know, it's amazing how many cars, especially uh, obvious with trucks and whatnot, you take your foot off the gas at 60, and boy, that, it acts like a windbreak. Whereas this thing literally cuts through the air like a knife. It's, it's yeah, it's a, one, it's a wonderful car. And you've got a comfort mode on here, but I, I can't tell the difference. I just leave it in sport, and that's what I like. I like a, a nice, firm ride. It tells me exactly what the car is doing. And I'm the first to admit I'm not good enough to make this car do what it does. But if you're an okay driver, it makes you a good driver. And if you're a good driver, it makes you an excellent driver. And if an excellent driver, it'll probably make you a race car driver. And it just goes. And you've got a series of lights here in the, spin in the uh, steering wheel, rather, that will let you know when you hit red line. Because it goes green, red, then blue, and then boom, you shift. The thing I like most about this car is the build quality, the power, the handling. It rivals anything from Europe anywhere. And I keep hate to keep saying it, it won Le Mans. I mean, Le Mans is very hard to win. Every manufacturer wants to win it. Ferrari, Porsche, Audi, and many of them have. But Ford's been there twice. Once 50 years ago when they won, and they came back 50 years later and won again. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. And I can't imagine how much pressure that must have been on Raj and the guys on the team. Because you say you're going to Le Mans, and if you don't win, oh my God, you're just gonna get beat up. Well, they did. And uh, case closed. And you got a full roll cage here, which, uh, meets all race certifications and all that stuff. So, hey, makes it a little tricky getting in, but I'll take that for the safety factor. You know, Ford had originally intended to go to Le Mans with some kind of modified Mustang, and they kind of started that project and said, nah, let's just go out and make an all-out race car. And I think the reason they were able to build this car was because of the success of the 2005 Ford GT. And obviously this car is not cheap. It's about a half a million bucks out the door. I think it's safe to say there's way more than that in development. Uh, this being the type of car that if you sell a thousand of them, maybe you break even on the technology and the engineering and the workmanship and all the uh, experimentation that went into getting it to be what it is. And again, it has that halo effect over the entire Ford line. If you build a car that went to Le Mans, probably pretty good at building SUVs and trucks and everything else as well. And there's a certain amount of national pride, I think, involved. I think everybody, if you're a car enthusiast, you like to see the car from your home country be successful. I was that way when Chevrolet ran at uh, Le Mans. They do an incredible job. Um, and that's why I'm happy for Ford or any American company that uh, does well in the, in the world theater like that. I guess they're only doing 250 cars a year. As I said, uh, this is one of the very first ones. I wanted the same serial number as my 2005, and I got it number 12, so it kind of had the matching pair, which is kind of funny. But, you know, when I got out of this one into the 2005, it does seem like a long time ago, even though it's only, what, 12 years, something like that. I like this motor very much. I like the torque characteristics of it. It's got plenty of torque, plenty of low-end power. I mean, if you didn't know it was a V6, you'd think it was a V8. You know, it's so funny. We live in an era now where it's more fashionable to tear everything down than rather applaud the accomplishments, you know? I mean, when I read the comments, people hate this car because of this. They don't like this feature. They don't like that feature. You know, please. You started from scratch. In two years, you took the car to Le Mans, and you, run the, and you won the toughest, most grueling race in the world. That alone should be, thank you, subject closed. But ultimately it comes down to, how does the car make you feel? And this makes you feel great when you're driving it. I mean, I know exactly where the front wheels are. I can feel the lightness in the car. 
I've got plenty of leg room. The seat goes back so I'm comfortable. Uh, it's firm, it's direct. The steering is spot on, it really is good. It's not, you know, a lot of people have these electric steering racks which are kind of weird. Uh, this is, everything is hydraulic. And it's just, uh, it's just a wonderful car. It really is. You know, it's funny with this carbon fiber tub, you hear every stone the tire picks up. <laughs> you hear it flying through the chassis underneath and being uh, exhausted out the back. And ground clearance is actually quite good. As I said before, I've done a thousand miles in about a week in this thing and I've yet to scrape anything. Got my first paint chip on it when a little rock hit the spoiler. That's all right. I'm so glad I put that uh, film over the paint on the front there. It does save you from stone chips. I put it on the windshield too. Oh, that's another thing. This windshield is made with that, what they call a Gorilla Glass, you know? Very thin, very strong, and most importantly, very light. All your controls are right here on the steering wheel. If you'll notice, this is the wiper up here. Uh, this is flasher headlights right there. This is the driving mode right now. I'm in sport. You have track. You have uh, normal. You have wet. You have uh, VMAX. Uh, you can't go into track while you're moving. You got to pull over to go into a uh, track for that. Windshield washer here. Uh, left turn signal, right turn signal. Um, this is your uh, cruise control. Uh, this is, you know, to talk to your sync system, the navigation, whatever. That's your OK button. Volume for radio, change station and radio. And as you can see, the dashboard changes depending on what mode you're in. If I go to normal, see, OK. It puts miles per hour up there, and it rides a little bit softer. You go back to sport and your uh, gear selection becomes the most important. And you got your tire pressure up there. And you can scroll through a bunch of things there. I love these paddles here, kind of cool, kind of elegantly done the way they're uh, kind of hollowed out or notched out there. Horn is right in the center. Uh, one thing American supercars always have better than anybody else is air conditioning and heating. I mean, you just touch the air conditioning, this thing is freezing in a minute. When I bought my F1 McLaren, it came with air conditioning, but if you wanted good air conditioning, <laughs> it was like a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 option. And, and the regular air conditioning was like, it was like, you know, like a snowman blowing on you for two minutes. You had to get, you know, anything above uh, uh, freezing, you had to uh, use the, uh, had to get the good air conditioning. Uh, as you can see, it's a standard Ford navigation system and all that, which is fine. Those work excellent to me. Uh, you know what this has that surprised me that most modern supercars, especially carbon fiber super cars, don't have is the AM radio button. Uh, I usually listen to news and information, weather, so I, I'll flip on AM. And most supercars, like the NSX, like the P1 McLaren, I don't know whether it's because it's an all carbon chassis and they can't get a good ground, but for some reason uh, they don't have the AM, so I'm grateful for that. I like that. And over here, these are your standard temperature, fan speed, and all the usual things like that. It's your ignition button here, engine on, off, and you got park, reverse drive, just turn that where you want. You do have a glove compartment of sorts. It's right here under the seat. There's a little uh, area there, which is quite handy for carrying uh, insurance papers, which you'll need to carry if you have this. Uh, I found that out already. You gotta have those insurance papers with you. Uh, the cool thing is you got this built-in tachometer here. Watch, when you get it up to red. Well, 
hope you enjoyed this look at the new uh, Ford GT. I, I'm pretty impressed with it. The only feature we didn't really use today is, uh, well, used a couple of them, is launch control. I don't really like launch control. I always feel I'm, I'm taxing the, uh, the drivetrain system. I prefer a rolling start. You know, put it in first gear, roll, and then nail it. That's what I like. I don't like to just start and, you know, twist everything all up with launch control. I, did, uh, I, I don't use it in any of the cars. But I'm very impressed with this. This thing is really incredible. And it's made in America, and that makes it kind of cool. And once again, one Le Mans goes down the history books. Uh, stay tuned. we got another video coming up right after this. It'll show you how you apply that uh, plastic film to the front of your car to keep from chipping. And you can put it on anything, you know, Ford Focus, Camaro, anything. And whatever you want, Mustang, whatever. And it's, it, it's pretty cool also. So uh, thanks for watching. I hope you like this little trip. I hope it gives you a feel of what it's like to be an owner of one of these as opposed to just getting in and driving it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very pleasant experience. I mean, it's, it's a great handling car. It's a lot of fun. And I uh, hope you liked this as much as I did. See you next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>